African American literature has always had elements of what many would refer to as science fiction. Historically, science fiction has been a genre focused on narratives of uh, the marginalized. In the works of Octavia Butler, and Afri African American literature is mingled with science fiction with startling fashion. <clears throat> in the minds of most Americans about the, above the age of 14 years old, science fiction is equated with robots and distant planets inhabited by aliens. Traditional science fiction is largely grounded in the practice of creating unexplored territories and frontiers filled with unfamiliar and unknown bodies. Creatures from the deepest, darkest corners of our imaginations have filled the pages of novels about the unknown and frightening. In turn, famil familiar and identifiable Western heroes like Buck Rogers and Tarzan have been constructed to challenge and vanquish all who resist and all who are different. Despite the lack of black bodies, science fiction, the correlation is a simple one to make. Where there is a discussion of robots and aliens, there is also a potential analogy to be made for third world culture and African American experience. Octavia Butler. Octavia Butler is a black woman science fiction writer who has paid her dues and fame, uh, her dues for fame and success as a writer. Over the past three decades, Butler has written 12 novels, Pattern Master, 1976, Mind of Mind, 1977, Survivor, 1978, Kindred, 19, uh, Kindred 1979, <coughs> Wild Sea, 1980, Clay's Ark, 19, Clay's Ark, 1984, Dawn, 1987, Adulta Rights, 1988, uh, uh, Imago, 1989, Parable of the Sword, 1993, Parable of the Talents, 1998, Pledge in 2005, and a collection of short stories entitled Bloodshot, published in first in 1995, then again in 2005. Now, I listed the dates for a reason, that is, that she, although the, the, the dates of publication uh, are when the books came out, that it doesn't follow the chronological order of the narratives. That is to say, uh, Pattern Master is the first book that she's written, but it's the fourth or fifth book in the series. So the woman's genius. Her mind doesn't work like most of our minds work. But we, we, maybe we can talk about that later on. Bella was a young girl uh, when she decided that, to try her hand at becoming a writer. She grew up in a segregated America and was very fortunate to overcome the mythology that the profession of writing was reserved for white men. After being exposed to science fiction that did not indulge images of African Americans uh, or particularly well-written storylines, Butler decided to produce her own version of the literature. About her writing, she says, or is quoted as saying, quote, I write about people who do extraordinary things. I just, it just turned out that it was called science fiction, end quote. Her prose are fluid and inviting, absent of convoluted esoteric techno gibberish found in some of the more traditional examples of juvenile science fiction. Butler's fiction transcends its way far beyond juvenile literature into what might be referred to as fantastical, mature African American literature. As a black woman who has overcome dyslexia, elements of racist America, and a myriad of obstacles located around the publication process, Butler has become a person who does extraordinary things. In no uncertain terms, Octavia Butler has opened the door to the genre of science fiction to the African American novelist and theorist via the fundamental questions of the marginalized body and imagination. Bola's uh, education, as you see here, is, is a modest one, but uh, I think the last point on the, uh, the PowerPoint is most important. The Clarion Science Fiction Writers Workshop is where all the heavy hitters go to come out, and that's where she, she, uh, she participated in 1970. Um, the distinction between science fiction um, <coughs> and fantasy has evoked a great deal of thought since the 1930s. Fantasy narratives are generally defined as stories based upon the supernatural. Demons, ghosts, witches, and fairies constitute the world of fantasy. 
Science fiction, on the other hand, entails a scientific or pseudo-scientific notion. Robots, time travel, life in the future, and the lives of extraterrestrials being uh, extraterrestrial beings are usually uh, understood to connote science fiction. Although the distinction between the two can be stark, it is common to find both classifications in a single narrative or under the same science fiction heading in the bookstores and libraries across the nation. Science fiction is one of the most successful forms of literature in the 20th and 21st <coughs> century and has become an American art form despite the fact that its origins are not within the bounds of the United States. Critics and producers of science fiction do not hesitate to admit, quote, all discussions of science fiction involve generalizations. The genre of science fiction has never been homogene homogeneously confined despite the efforts of many pioneer writers to uh, delineate clear boundaries for this form of, of, of writing. In fact, what, most, what is most significant about the genre is its history, in its, and its history is that, like American folklore, science fiction is still very much in the making. Writers like Octavia Butler and the genre that is still being defined by contemporary history and imaginations of its contributors. In Butler's case, she is transforming ideas surrounding bodies, even as she has to assume a narrative and, and assume or navigate an inherent ensemble of values and distinctions. It is this dynamic, generic structure in combination with her thematic art, uh, attention to the question of the body that allows Bowman to take up the subject of the genesis and the possible apocalyptic decline of humanity in such a provocative fashion. The insight, juxtapositions, and re revelations that are produced in Bowman's fiction are due in an important sense to the flexibility of the genre of science fiction. <coughs> especially the willingness of the reader to consider what would be rejected in, as nonsensical in the other genre. Science fiction is a literature very much invested in demystifying the identity of bodies outside of the norm. The, as industrialization created uh, mechanical slaves, the question of humanity remained just as urgent as they were during the antebellum America. One of Butler's most significant contributions to the genre has been to employ a future, I'm sorry, has been to employ the future in a way that reminds her readers of historical questions of identity with narratives that may or may not be based on historical fact and reality, but are definitely valuable tools in seeing some aspects of reality in a clear light. In other words, science fiction and fantasy have always been viewed as an imaginative mirror reflecting pieces of reality. This fact does not evade the science fiction fantasy works of Butler, despite the fact that her writing crosses many blurred genre lines. Annalise Mecca, please report to the As a genre, desk. science fiction is unique in its popular Mecca, conception, but especially in its uh, subject you. matter. With the appearance of <coughs> R.U.R., Rosman's Universal Robot in 1921 by Czechoslovakian author and playwright Carol Capet, science fiction forever attached, is forever attached to the notion of servitude. Capix R.U.R. told the story of a company that created synthetic men to be used as slaves. Eventually, these uh, synthetic men revolted and set out to destroy <coughs> the humans that enslaved them. Oddly enough, Capix is credited for being the inventor of the word robot or the mechanical man slave. This is not to be confused with Frankenstein. But the analogy is there, not to mention the Matrix, which we'll talk about at the end of this presentation. It is Capix's contribution that also invites the corollary placement of the African-American body at the center of any discourse about robots or extraterrestrials in general. This correlation is suggested by the status of slavery as a, <coughs> by the status of slavery as a key American historical marker, a historical moment in which the African-American body performs a pivotal role in the general social process. Since 1921 and Capix's contribution, science fiction has spoken directly to the question of the body through discourses of master and slave or the human and the other. Thus, the genre of science fiction has been a primary site in which to examine the construction of otherness. If understood simply as singular pronouns, race, sex, and gender are mystical processes of categorizing, 
but as a composite or somewhat unitary structure, they help form the building blocks of the body's identity in society. Butler's fiction presents unique ways to imagine and ultimately to understand the body and its uh, plethora of identities. Her work allows the body to uh, be thought outside the traditional definitions of the term. Butler's pattern master series takes its reading, its readers on the journey of Genesis filled with shapeshifters and non-material entities who manipulate their material and spiritual worlds like the Yoruba deity Elegba in order to create a new race of people. The book of Genesis from the pattern master series is Wild Seed. Very much like the biblical book of Genesis, Wild Seed is the beginning of the creation story uh, and the introduction of the pa uh, patriarch and matriarch, Doral and Yanni. Butler's fiction, uh, before I get to the, the details of uh, the, the narrative, Butler's fiction is important because it places black women at the center of every narrative, or women of color at the center of every narrative. So she's definitely a product of the black women's movement, which of course comes after the black women's power movement. She's responding to the black women's movement in everything that she writes. She is a black feminist. She uses both hard and soft sciences. Uh, traditional science fiction usually focuses on most of the hard sciences, you know, time travel, physics, and so forth. But she deals with some of the more softer sciences, as well as fantasy elements that I've already talked about. Uh, her uh, fiction can be categorized as speculation, uh, near future. Many of the, her, her narratives and plots take place in the very near future, like 2024. We'll talk about that in a, in a few moments. But uh, she she writes narratives that uh, could could really happen today. In fact probably do happen. In fact, she's, uh, many of her narratives have been prophetic, particularly the Parable series. She basically <coughs> predicted George Bush's uh, uh, presidency, as well as some other things that we might get a chance to talk about later on. She, her, although her literature focuses on people of color, or people of color at the center of her narratives, it didn't focus on people, people of color, it's people of color at the center of her narratives, she is not a writer of strictly African-American uh, African-American audiences. She has a broad humanitarian audience, and I think her fiction demonstrates that quite uh, evidently. Uh, also, in addition to uh, uh, the other things that I mentioned, her writing is extremely accessible. Uh, unlike uh, uh, her colleague, uh, Sandy Delaney, who is a, from a background of literary theory, uh, she uh, uses very plain language, uh, not trying to uh, keep anybody outside of her narrative. She embraces people of all races, cultures, genders, and so forth. Details about the pattern, the pattern of the series. The, uh, again, the patriarch and matriarch, Anyanu and Dora. Anyanu is a, um, Anyanu is a black woman who possesses the ability to take the shape of any animal, human or beast, that she understands genetically or intuitively. Such understanding is obtained by visual assessment or by ingesting the flesh of an animal by simply reproducing its genetic structure and physical form. In explaining her ability to Doro, Anyanu says, I could, quote, I could see what the leopard was like. I could mold myself into what I saw. I was not a true leopard, though, until I killed one and ate a little of it. At first, I was a woman pretending to be a leopard, clay molded into leopard shape. Now, when I change, I am a leopard. Some pretty heavy stuff here. She can take, she's a shapeshifter, right? Which is interesting and intriguing in a lot of ways, particularly when we think about gender and race. If a woman can take the form of a man, what does that say about the definition of woman or the definition of man for that matter? More accurate assessment of what Anyanu becomes after take, tasting the flesh of an animal is, uh, and imitating its form externally and internally is something more, uh, is something very similar to Dora, an essence of an individual uh, in the shell of a temporary body. At the age of 13, uh, Doro left his body and uh, took on the bodies of his parents. And so frightened, he continued to take bodies. And he's been doing this for some thousands of years now. Ship jumping from body to body. I think there were some films, that, uh, it was a film with Denzel Washington. I can't remember the name of it, it came out maybe a decade ago where this kind of happened. But Doro kills the person's essence that he takes on. Okay. He doesn't just like borrow the body, he takes the body and kills whatever is inside of it. But we'll, we'll, maybe we'll get into that later. Um, thus, it is this act of incorporation of another body and becoming the body that is at the foundation of the question that acts as the primary engines of the entire series. Is the body dependent on or independent of the notion of essence or self? 
Does the identity and existence of a person necessarily begin and end with the material body? Anyanu's ability to become a leper, which is not to be confused with merely taking the shape of it, implies that Anyanu's self is not limited by material forms that she incorporates. The elements that identify Anyanu are not necessarily attached to a particular structure of flesh and bone or specific material body, but do involve something that is material. What I mean by this is that Anyanu's self is real and ideal, perhaps spiritual, simultaneously. The exact shape or color of Anyanu and self is insignificant. Race is insignificant. At the same time, it becomes important, but insignificant. How do we construct race? Why do we construct race? This is the question that this, this situation begs. The, uh, because until it takes the physical, I'm sorry, the, the, the exact shape or color of Anyanu or, or, or Doro's self is insignificant. Because until it takes a physical form, there are no consequences to be dealt with in the real world. Butler places Doro in a real and complicated, as real and complicated uh, patriarch, patriarchal role. By this, I mean that Doro's character is not formulated from simplistic binary uh, per perspectives. Uh, he is never portrayed as, as in the narrative as being purely good or purely bad. Doro is a complicated, ambiguous persona focused on accomplishing his goals, which is to create another race of people like himself, uh, with as much, with, his, with the least amount of resistance uh, from his charges and interference with his charges. <coughs> the reader does, however, learn the third paragraph by the third paragraph of the Wild Sea uh, that Doro cannot be completely or simply human. As Doro wanders from village to village, being pulled by the unexplained awareness, he is killed several times by disease, by animals, and by hostile people. Yet he continues to move southwest, end quote. Thus, Doro exists, existence is independent of the birth and death of a body, but is dependent upon the inhabitation of a body for life. What this phenomenon does is raise the question of who or what is Doro and how is his or its identity constructed. Doro's identity is independent of flesh and bone. His, the body of Doro can uh, act as a dis, uh, disposable mobile home to be used primarily for reproduction and transportation, not depending on the body he inhabits, but his essence remains constant. The description of what he is by Nyanu reads as, as, as follows, quote, he was like an Ikbanji, uh, an evil child spirit born to one woman again and again, only to die and give the, uh, the, the mother more pain. A mother tormented by an Ibanji could give birth many times and still have no living child. But Doro was an adult. He did not enter and re-enter his mother's womb. He did not want the bodies of children. He preferred the, uh, to steal bodies of men." In the above passage, Anyanu identifies Doro as something from the spirit world that manifests only as body, in, a, in or among the worlds of bodies, without being only one body. Anyanu questions the hypothesis, uh, her hypothesis because Doro is an adult and does not live in the womb of, of mothers. But as the narrative unfolds, we learn that Doro does indeed operate largely through the form of, uh, through and from the reproductive systems of women and men. Above the Xenogenesis series, uh, gone, uh, the Xenogenesis series uh, goes one step further by introducing the post-apocalyptic humanity to gene traders <coughs> and Kali, uh, who have bodies that rewrite gender and sexuality with a third sex. In Butler's Dawn, the body matters because it extends far beyond flesh and bone. The body becomes a boundless edifice for the articulation of difference. The second and third books of the Xenogenesis series Adulthood rights and imago suggest the, argu the, uh, suggest the argument that ambiguity in regards to identity can be both empowering and necessary for the survival of human identity. Through a close examination of Butler's writing of the characters of Ken, one of the first human slash Owen Kali constructs, and Joe Das, the first third sex human Owen Kali construct, the importance of ambiguity with regards to sex, race, and gender uh, as well as human, human identity is shown to be immeasurable. The ability of, of both characters, human Owen Kali constructs, to act as 
uh, go-betweens and bridges between human and non-human differences suggest, uh, I propose, a new way of thinking the figure of the multiple reference identity of the tragic mulatto. The tragic mulatto of Butler's fiction is not tragic at all. It's empowering. Akin's ability to understand humanity's need to survive independently and Joe Doss's ability to shape the color of its body to please the par its partners all suggest uh, that being in a state of ambiguity is a positive attribute that should be sought after instead of avoiding. The first book in Butler's recent parable series, Parable of the Sower, is both a travelogue narrative and a sort of Bible all in one. Uh, it consists of four parts that coincide with four years of the narrative, 2024, 25, and 26, and 27. Parable begins, like most of Butler's novels, with an awakening of, central, of the central character. Uh, on Saturday morning, July 20th, in the year 2024, Lauren Olamina begins her 15th birthday with a brief journal entry describing a prophetic a recurring dream. The dream reminds Lauren that the security that she and her community depend on is false and fleeting. Lauren's dream foreshadows the destruction of, neighboring, of her neighbor, neighborhood community and the changes that she will have to adapt to if she is to survive. Is, is to survive. Quote, the neighborhood wall is a massive, looming presence nearby. I see it as a crouching animal, perhaps about to spring more threatening than protective. But my stepmother is there, and she isn't afraid. I stay with her. I am seven years old." Quote. In Lauren's dream, the wall that surrounds her small neighborhood of Roberto, California, some 20 miles east of California, is compared to an animal preparing to, to strike out and devour all of Lauren's home and what she values. In the first three uh, short chapters of Parable, we learn that the wall is supposed to protect the members of the Blado community from its surrounding environment, infested with poor squatters, winos, junkies, and homeless people in general. Instead, in Lauren's dream, the wall is a symbol that threatens to unleash an inevitable change. <clears throat> the wall represents boundaries we place up in our everyday society. These walls are bound to come down at some point. Octavia Butler's fiction presents methods of imagining the body that allow us to understand how and why the body must be uh, categorized as male, female, black, white, and other. From, the window, from this window, readers of her work <coughs> are better, better able to explore the meaning of various identities such as race, sex, and gender. These terms are seen for what they are, arbitrary markers designed to give stability to that which is unstable and ambiguous. Science fiction is the window Butler uses to open the imagination of readers about the problematic of the body by painting the, fanta painting the fantastical as the realistic. For Butler, the highest goal of humanity is survival by any means necessary, but mainly by accepting difference and acknowledging the inevitability of an omnipotence of change. The uh, synchronization of humanity is an impossibility, not worthy of pursuit in Butler's narratives, primarily because sameness is not in Butler's definition of better world. As her narratives seem to suggest, sameness or conformity does not ensure the survival of a species in a hostile environment. In fact, the ability to change and adapt to conform non-conformity is often essential to a character that wishes to survive in any of Butler's <coughs> narratives. <coughs> Notwithstanding the latter of fact, her work constructs communities dependent upon uh, individuals and individuals dependent upon communities. As I said, Butler is definitely a, a product of the, of the black women's movement, and of course, a product of the black African power movement. Butler's writing <coughs> has an African sensibility. In there. I've made several references to that. Uh, East African philosophy, I am because we are, we are because I am. The notion of uh, uh, using West African cultures and integrating that into her narratives are common things. She's trying to, and I think successfully, transcend purely Western aesthetics and embrace a different aesthetic. An aesthetic that, that might speak to a third world audience, more so than others. The elements of the top, top, totalitarianism found in books of Pattern Series, especially uh, in uh, Pattern Master and Wild Scene, are portrayed as restricted and violent. The children of Doro <coughs> claim to advocate peace and order for both humans and patterns, yet systems of slavery and familial murder 
permeate their communities. In short, Butler's narratives render a view of social philosophies that are based on hierarchy and privilege. Butler does not write about utopias. At best, she writes dystopias, or as I like to say in my book, uh, realistic utopias, but not the traditional notion of utopia. It's not, it has no place when the notion of change is paramount in the narrative. In an interview with uh, uh, Rosalie Harrison, uh, Butler says that the standard science fiction novel, uh, in the standard science fiction novel, the universe is either green or white. In such literature, the extraterrestrial being or alien is used as metaphor and literal embodiment of the other. Butler, on the other hand, locates highly visual race and sex or species uh, and non-visual gender and sexuality identities at the center of her text and focuses the reader forces the reader to grapple with the notion of otherness as more than metaphors of illusion. In an interview with Veronica Mixon, Butler speaks to the influence that white, the influence that white male writers as well as women writers, such as Ursula Le Guin, <coughs> have had on her writing career. This point is pertinent to both the success and complexity of Butler's uh, literature, not to mention her concern with increasing the number of African American readers of her texts and of science fiction as a genre. Butler employs both the architecture and themes from uh, the genre of science fiction to discuss notions of identity that are specifically concerned to women of color and other marginalized people. She employs the traditional tools of science fiction used to influence young white adolescent males to revise feminine slave narratives and, and possibly rethink the construction and location of other, others in literature and society. The engagement of feminist notions is not at all unique in the works of Octavia Butler or the genre of science fiction. Joanna Roos, for example, uh, was, <clears throat> was notorious for producing fiction that uh, represented powerful heroines in genres that often looked, uh, uh, looked uh, sorry, often, which overlooked the role of women. In her Nebula Award winning short story, When It Changed, uh, in her novel, The Female Man, presented worlds where men were either extinct or obsolete, and women filled all social roles. It was to be expected that Roos offended uh, a great many of her male colleagues. She was called bitchy, strident, and, and, and propagandist. Uh, such harsh criticism also uh, undoubtedly fell upon Ursula Le Guin as a result of her novel, Left Hand and Darkness, published in 1969. In Le Guin's bi <coughs> ambisexual world of winter, she attempted to write race without gender, but only succeeded in creating a political battlefield filled with female men. <coughs> Where Roos and Le Guin speak of only gender, Butler speaks of gender and race as inextricable from each other and far more complicated in the racially homogenous societies found in the works of her feminist <coughs> predecessors. In the left hand of darkness, a world free of gender does not mean the end of all problems. War, slavery, and other blatant <coughs> oppression with uh, which we are familiar might be absent, but Le Guin's assertion that the rigid gender divisions are directly related to our largest social problem is a profound declaration that may be incomplete. What is lacking in Le Guin's line, or Le Guin's line of questioning, is how other identities complicate problems of the body in addition to gender. The fiction of Butler takes on such complicated questions and offers alternative uh, alternatives of survival in settings that are far from utopian or homogenous. While Butler's uh, Butler readily admits the fact that many of the pioneer science fiction writers influenced her understanding of the genre. It must not be overlooked that Butler's writing has both influenced writers who have been in the business of producing science fiction longer than her, as well as paved the way for new African American men and women writers to explore the possibilities of science fiction as a genre. For example, Tananarive really Du. Uh, two novels, uh, Tanari Du's novels, The Between, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Blood series, including My Soul to Keep, uh, The Living Blood, Blood Colony, and my, I'm sorry, My Soul to Keep, yeah, uh, Living Blood and Blood Colony, uh, Nettle Hopkinson's, uh, Nettle Hopkinson's uh, Brown Girl in, in the Rain, uh, and uh, Detective Stories of Walter Mosley, uh, Blue Light, are all examples of works moving out of the African American science fiction tradition spearheaded by Butler's writing. African American literature, by definition, has always been invested in rendering fiction, nonfiction, <coughs> and theory about uh, figuration of bodies and how they have been how they have been understood in an American context. 
Butler's construction of non-traditional bodies suggests that social values and practices are directly influenced by the society's understanding of the body. Butler's writing poses difficulties for the way we typically identify bodies. The difficulty arises because Butler's writing brings a structure uh, we use to identify bodies as different and alike into critical awareness. Race, gender, and sex are positive in Butler's narratives, and the narratives of countless other African American novelists and storytellers as functions of difference and likeness, which demonstrate both the flaws and strengths in human behavior and methods of identification. Such a figuration amounts to a formation of the dominant conceptions of the body in contemporary thought. Octavia Butler forced, has forged a path in the genre that is, pr is prime for the African American exploration. Uh, the genre of science fiction is the new frontier for African American literature that might lead to a more vivid view of the past and future uh, of, for the person of color in America. In regards to this past and future, Butler's fiction directly responds to popular culture. There's some really good examples of how Butler's fiction, uh, whether it be unintentional or intentional, it translates into some things that we've, we've probably paid money to see. Uh, two of the films that I wanted to briefly uh, talk about would be uh, Aliens, uh, which came out in 1986, and Avatar, which came out in 2010, both directed by James Cameron. These are extremely important social narratives that support the notion that race as a social race as a social and commercial construct. Yeah. Aliens' uh, production budget is 17 was 17 million dollars. I had a worldwide gross of 131 million dollars. Uh, the Avatar uh, had a production uh, budget of 300. And Sixty million dollars, uh, whereas uh, its gross earnings was two point seven billion dollars to date. Uh, as an addition, there's another alien alien that's coming out this summer. It's a prequel to Aliens. I think it's called Prometheus. I'm excited about it. Both Aliens and Avatar are post-colonial narratives. Like Octavia Butler's fiction, she uses the, the genre of science fiction to say, well, what if, how are post-colonial narratives identifiable with the real world, right? How, the, how does the real world uh, write the other, the, the, the native, the, the colonizer? These two films do just that. I would suggest that Octavia Butler's fiction does it more critically, with more detail, and I guess you all, they always say, the book is always better than the, than the movie, because you got more space yeah, in the budget. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> The notion of how race is constructed is evident in these films and is evident in Octavia Butler's fiction. Uh, in what ways might race be attached to gender? Evident. Uh, oh, and I also have some, some theories if, if you're interested. Uh, how is race constructed? W. E. Boyce has plenty of references to this notion. Uh, Bell Hooks talks about race as, and how it's attached to gender. Uh, and gender is gender, gender purely performative. Judith Butler is another uh, common name used in theorizing uh, gender. How do dark bodies figure into the collective consciousness? Okay, Carl Jung. These, Carl Jung, these, uh, these, these ideas, these topics are all central to Butler's fiction, but they speak to several, several ideas, several genres across, uh, across fields of study. And of course, can sexuality be imagined beyond the body? I'm getting to these films in just a second. Butler's fiction makes us question aesthetics, and it makes it, it changes all the touches. That's a riff off the blog. This first uh, clip is taken from Okay, uh, in this scene, this obviously is, is a question of gender being, uh, gender performance being, being presented to the audience. Uh, Vasquez is um, an interesting character. Like many of Octavia Butler's female characters, she uh, plays she plays the, uh, the fence in the sense that she does things that are feminine, yet she also does things that are traditionally identified as masculine. And uh, in this particular film, as I, I don't know, has anyone seen the Aliens? The whole film? I know it's kind of old. Okay. Um, in this particular film, Vasquez turns out to be sort of a, a, a sub character, a sub character, but a heroine nonetheless. 
in that uh, the guy she's you know she gives a high five to, there's an implication that that might be her lover. Right? So there's this, this heterosexual relationship going on, but it's it's kind of blurry because she carries a big gun, of course, guns uh, in the film. She carries this big long phallic gun, right? And she shoots it well. In fact, I think she shoots it better than her the, the guy that she was with. The idea is that. This narrative brings into question uh, what does woman mean uh, and how should the audience identify to this notion of this definition of woman. She clearly, Vasquez does not mean the, the uh, cardinal virtues of womanhood as we traditionally understand it. They pure, pious, domestic, and, and submissive. Submissive has nothing to do with Vasquez. Yet and still, by the end of the narrative, she does have a sense of nurturing, a sense of love, and yeah. though it might be closer to the masculine side, she is a character that's ambiguous, and she's a character that I think Butler develops much better in her, uh, her Xenogenesis series, a character entitled Lilith, called Lilith, who also plays the face part of The next piece, I hope, is from the, uh, from the same movie. No, no, it's not from the same movie. Where is it? Uh, it's from the same movie, yes. Okay, so that moment where she tilts her head, you can interpret it as you like, uh, but the idea here is that the colonizer has decided that this, this does not work. This is not meet the, my standard of aesthetics. Uh, this is somehow a threat to me because this is different. And difference is central to the entire scene here, as, as it is in all like Kevin literature. Whereas uh, Butler suggests that we need to embrace difference, right? Uh, and then she actually has characters uh, in her short story entitled Bloodchild where the male human it has to uh, enter a relationship that's analogous to sexu a sexual relationship with a 10 foot long caterpillar person, the ticket to it. And the, the female is a, a matriarchal society, and the ticket to it implants her ovipositor into the abdomen of the male human and deposits eggs. And that male human has to carry those eggs around until the eggs are old enough to hatch, right? So the pregnant man story is how this is interpreted. This uh, the film, Aliens, is very analogous to that in the sense that. These aliens capture humans, hosts, and, and put their uh, their uh, eggs or whatever into them. Hug, they, face huggers, or whatever they're called. It's kind of it's kind of it switched up a little bit. But uh, and then of course they burst from the chest, which is the famous alien uh, one movie scene. They burst from the chest, and the, the, the host is left dead. There's some similar, similar things that happen in both scenarios. But the, the question here is uh, gender roles. What is a woman? A woman is a person that gives birth to children. Well, no. In science fiction uh, drama, we can play with that notion. We can deconstruct it. We can ask, well, yeah. does this truly define a womanhood? Does motherhood truly define a womanhood? No, it can't. It doesn't. And so, here we have an example. Also, I would just kind of throw this in, too. Uh, the entire uh, series of aliens, aliens 1, 2, and 3, I won't go to 1, 2, and 3, uh, very analogous to a text called How Africa, How Europe Undeveloped Africa by Walter Ryden. Where the viewers, Africa's undeveloped by Europe uh, via the three M's. First, you send in the, uh, the missionaries. I'm sorry, first, you send in the merchants, right? The trades, harmless. Then, you send in uh, the uh, missionaries. Okay? My God is better than your God. Right? And oh, if your religion doesn't like you because you have twins, or because some other reason you consider a taboo, you can join my religion. Right? And then, the last is the, the mercenaries essentially to take over anything that has already been given to the colonizers. This series of films replays or reinvisions re 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 that Walter uh, Rodney narrative. Okay. Okay. So uh, I want to go forward uh, to another film, and this is uh, Aliens Three. I hope. Okay. So I love the music in that scene. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, so the, the, the series deviates slightly from Walter Rodney's three ends. Okay, so Aliens 1 would be the, mer the merchants, right? Uh, Aliens 2 would be the mercenaries, and Aliens 3 would be the, uh, the missionaries, believe it or not. The one that you just saw was taken by Aliens 3, and uh, it basically uh, Ripley lands on a planet, a prison planet, full of ex-convicts and rapists and murderers. Much like, I guess, the colonies used to be in there, but... Um, the, uh, the, these rapists and murders have converted. They, they become sort of monks, thus the religious element is played out. And, uh, and of course, uh, she cuts her hair off, so her maternity is, is left into question. 
but we find out in the midst of the film that she has been impregnated or, or she's been turned into a host by the, the alien that she thought she killed in the previous movie. And uh, to, to, to riff off, and I'm not sure if the director is familiar with this, but to riff off the 1915 uh, movie, Birth of the Nation, uh, where uh, uh, the little girl, I can't even name, uh, but she's a sister, I think, little sister of the protagonist, uh, Birth of the Nation, uh, a, 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 a soldier named Gus, who's a northern soldier, is going to rape her. And he chases her. He wants. He asks her to marry. She says, "No, no, no, never." And then she runs through to the woods, and she ends up on a cliff. And on this cliff, the little girl, I think she's an adolescent, uh, would rather die than to be sullied by the hands of Gus, this black. Well, he's a white guy in blackface, but this black uh, soldier. Okay. And so, to maintain her purity, her her, uh, her womanhood, her true virtue, you know, purity, piety, domesticity, and submissive, she jumps off of the, the ledge and kills her to her death. And she dies. Here, I, uh, the, the, the character of Ripley Scott, she's been uh, asked by some, some a guy, I'll just show you, she's been asked by a guy, a scientist who wants to take her body back and take the genie out of her body and to study it, to reproduce it, to gain all that he can as far as science and maybe who knows what. He wants that alien body, that marginalized body to manipulate, to, to gain a prostate, which is what we've been talking about for the last hour or so, but was fiction, right? The, the marginalized body as a, as a, a, a for free labor or for profit, right? Uh, Ripley says, no, I don't want that to happen. In fact, I'd rather die than allow that to happen. So she, like the, the little girl from Birth of the Nation, jumps to her, her death, and you get the Christ-like imagery, clearly, right? And she embraces the child, the mulatto child, the biracial child, the ambiguously defined child, the alien child that has human DNA. And she embraces it, but not out of motherly embrace, out of embrace to destroy it or to commit genocide. And she burns. Of course, there's another movie that comes out of this where her clone is made <laughs> and she's reproduced. But that's Hollywood. But but I think my, my purpose is with regards to comparing this to Walter Ryan is clear. So there you have aliens. And uh, as I said, uh, the the first movie alone, this didn't include the aliens two and three, but the first movie alone uh, grossed some uh, 131 million dollars. So this suggests to me that uh, uh, that there's a there's a message going to the, to the populace, and the message is that we're interested in those ideas. Even if we don't want to talk about the birth, we're interested in the notions of race, class, and gender. We'd like to see them play out on the screen in front of us, and maybe even uh, to work some things out. Um, let me go on to the next film here, The Avatar. Which I, anyone see Avatar? Just, just curious. No? Okay, I'm shocked. I thought you had to see Avatar. Uh, so, The Avatar. And I think I just have one clip from The Avatar. Um, I'll come back to it in just a second. Um, the films uh, in their popularity speak volumes about how America sees itself and others today and in the future. All three, all two of the films, uh, all, all three of the films, all three of the films uh, are about how America sees itself and others. Like I said that. All three of the films are anchored in the genre of science fiction and the notion of dystopian speculation. More importantly, all three films are completely dependent upon a narrative of dark bodies and their quest for subjectivity and identity. Hence, the monetary investment and yields of these commercial undertakings urgently suggest that America is consciously <laughs> struggling with, Carl with the value and employment of dark bodies and its imagination and reality. So what we watch, we, we are what we eat. What is it? You are what you eat. We are what we watch as well. Um, <laughs> But also, what we watch and what we read helps dictate how we envision ourselves in the future or tomorrow. Science fiction is great because oftentimes, as we said, it talks about the future. It, it, it talks about what hap might happen tomorrow. Well, when we take that and we consider ideas of identities placed upon bodies like race, sex, and class, it tells us how we're probably going to view these people, these, these, these human beings, in the future. And looking at aliens and even the 2010, uh, Avatar, uh, Avatar, it's not promising. It suggests that the same narrative continues to play out again and again and again. If there's colonization, if there's this notion of seeking out different, uh, different lands to uh, instill our notion or our, our aesthetic, then there's a problem there. And I think the Butler's uh, literature addresses it. I don't think the films necessarily consciously address it, but they got people like me thinking about things like that. So those are the films. Uh, there are some things about Katie Butler. If you can read my book, 
I think I can uh, elaborate a little more in more, with more detail about some of the ideas I've talked about today and some of the text. Uh, thank you very much for your patience. Yeah. I'd love to have some discussion about some more questions about some of the things that I said or didn't say. Uh, questions you might have or comments. Yes. Uh, I'm a little bit more uh, optimistic than you are in terms of being uh, If we went back to Avatar, it seems to me that the notion in Avatar is, is an indication of two things. And two things have become a criticism or a critique of, uh, of Walter Rodney's work. First is the question of agency on the part of the press people. It's clear, it's there. Uh, the second part is that um, Avatar, in large part, is an indication that uh, oppression is always opposed and hardly ever wins out over the long term. Uh, the real issue is whether or not the oppressed then become oppressors, so that those become, become critical issues. Um, we um, will, I like to do a lot of science fiction too, so it's, it's, a, it's a good thing, but part of what I'm, what I'm um, interested in here is in part what you alluded to, but that sits at the core. In many ways, the science fiction that we're looking at is not just simply a, a question of articulating the future. It talks about who we are right now. And so it explores in different ways the ways in which we have used things like imperialism, race, class, gender, sexual preference, et cetera, and so on, as tools of oppression and marginalization, et cetera, and so on. And ask the question of how do we get out of that? So in some ways, it's, it's a, even though it's a genre that many of us in the academy are trying to figure out what to do with in conventional sense, it's a genre that speaks to um, a number of ways of entering into some very um, interesting critiques, particularly given the, the technological area that we live in China, about who we are and who we might become. You know, I want to, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I want to say about the uh, Avatar film. I love films as far as the movie to go see and the visuals. I think I saw it in the uh, IMAX 3D or something. So, I mean, I saw the bugs, you know, I was literally going like this, you know, great. Uh, but as far as, as the, I, you know, I love your optimistic uh, reading of the movie. Uh, and I agree with the agency that is present. However, it's an agency of the Navi, of the marginalized characters. That is uh, the suspect, and that, uh, like many narratives that came before, his central character is this white guy. Oh, yeah, yeah. And this white guy who, like Tarzan, for example, is going to be a better Navi than the Navi themselves. And that's extremely problematic uh, for, for me. Uh, so, this, this white guy who has lost his legs and is not happy with his body, right? Reading from body uh, perspective, he's, he's lost his, the use of his legs, his limbs, and therefore he uh, dreams. And this is about dreaming. He dreams of having the body of Michael Jordan, only a few feet tall, I think, not the of ten feet tall. And he, because of this white privilege, he gets to take on that body. And he, he gets to become Michael Jordan, or the blue version of Michael Jordan. And he gets all the, the, the tall blue women that Michael Jordan might have access to. And that's how the movie ends. And that was extremely disturbing, despite the agency that I think not be demonstrated. And, uh, and as part of the second comment that you made, I, I agree with the, the notion that science fiction speaks to today very much so. And I think Octavia Butler uh, goes to uh, extra lengths, her, her fiction, particularly Beginning with Kindred, 1979 publication. Uh, she talks about how the future and the past become, has become as one. How it's, there's no, particularly there's no such thing as the past and the future. It's all about now. Everything that happened dictates what is happening and what will happen. And I think Kendrick, uh, a narrative that is definitely on the defense of science fiction slash just traditional or revisionary slavery, it's very much responding to that notion of time and past and present being as one point, having that line divided. From one perspective, you can show clear in terms of the other? Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about um, why in your opinion there's such little scholarly attention given to what you're And if you anticipate that changing in the future? 
Yeah, well, I'm sense. hoping it will change. Uh, I think um, scholarly attention is well, Science fiction has, uh, in the past three decades, I think it has had attention to some literary theory. There's no doubt. Uh, as far as uh, African American science fiction, that I think is sparse. Uh, I don't think there's a shortage of theory, literary theory on science fiction, particularly in the last three decades. But I can't be bothered after you exercise fiction. Well, I think there is. And I think it's because of the audience, because of uh, uh, what professors are saying. What should we do with this genre that's traditionally been focused to, to adolescents? Right? And for African Americans, it's traditionally focused on white male adolescents. Right? Whereas, you know, I was trying to move to the beginning. Octavia Butler suggested uh, uh, science fiction at, at some point earlier on uh, was about white and green, you know, white heroes and green aliens. And so I think her fiction, as well as Samuel Delaney's fiction, uh, begins to shift that. And I think some of the more uh, contemporary authors they are increasing the audience of science fiction readers and therefore increasing the scholarship being produced in the field. So I, I'm very positive about you know, more scholarship coming out, particularly you know, pertaining to, to, to people that we're familiar with. Can you take this African American science fiction novel and apply it to ideas of Derrida, Dye, uh, Lacan, uh, uh, Du Bois, uh, Bell Hooks? Yes, you can, quite easily, I think. And so I think there's a positive uh, outcome. There's a positive, a lot of stuff is coming out. And hoping that uh, maybe I'm helping that, that process in all of my, my text. Yes? Um, one of the things I, I was interested in was uh, about what you were saying is it seems to me that there's a notion that uh, the African body is, is both, can be both, uh, or, or the African people you can be either, either colonized, <coughs> but also they're they're also the displaced, the out of place, right? Uh, so so they, they 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 straddle that line where uh, they're uh, they're so the, the the white man or is, is the person that in truth then brings back home and sees. His, sees their environment uh, colonized from the inside by the slave. Uh, and I was wondering whether you could uh, speak to that uh, idea. And, and in a way, I'm, I was wondering whether uh, Ripley uh, could not be seen as uh, perhaps not the colonizer, but the, yeah, the slave. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I think I get it. Um, Something I talk about in one of my chapters is a uh, philosopher uh, by the name of Willis Yankee. Right? And uh, uh, he has a term, uh, it's called from an article, uh, The Fourth Stage. Uh, and in this, in this article, he talks about uh, the Kathonic, C H T H O N I C. And um, it's, uh, in short, it's a space that is in between the Platonic notion of the real and the idea. The Catholic would be, if you, if you do concentric circles, the Catholic would include the real and the ideal and the space of some ambiguity. Uh, the marginalized body oftentimes is in that, almost always is in that space of, of, of the ambiguity of the Catholic realm and the real and the ideal. So, yes, the colonizer can be, oftentimes is the colonizer. Uh, several things at once. The, 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 the oppressor can be the oppressed easily, right? In fact, the, the notion of the marginalized character of the African American, the African American literature, well, the trickster character is oftentimes several things at once. Brer Rabbit, for example. Sometimes we like Brer Rabbit. He's great. He's our hero. Bugs Bunny, whatever, right? We like him. But the other time, turn the page, he does something mean and cruel. So this notion of ambiguity is a, is a, is a, is a space that I think Octavia Butler's fiction treats as normative, as opposed to something to be, you know, that, that might represent chaos or, or something that we don't want to play around with. So yeah, to, to apply that notion of defining to Ripley's characters is easily is, 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 is done. Yeah. She is also a victim, as well as uh, a perpetrator. Wait, there's one part of the No, I didn't respond to what you're saying. No, 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 you, you did, but in, in, in that sense, uh, my question becomes, um, what does it mean that she's white? What does it mean that she's white? So, you know, in, in other words, is she taking the place of the black? 
is she reenacting uh, or, or, or living uh, or experiencing uh, blackness, or or is it or not? I, swear, I think you're switching gears. But I don't think the colonizing process necessarily is dealing about race necessarily. It's, it's, it is complicated. It's more, more, more complicated than just race. It's not about black and white. <coughs> None of it is about yeah. simply black and white. And so uh, I'm not sure that uh, yeah, the side part of hard. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. fact that Ripley's a white or, or white character hair. has it's a lot of weight. Funny. It's more important in the narrative that she's a colonizer. That she's on the ship that comes to a planet that's not hers. And she, in this, in this film, she's coming to kill, commit genocide upon these dark bodies. They have to be tall, slender black bodies with spears. <laughs> um, I mean, just on the back of that, I mean, I think Avatar is unquestionably full of colonialism, although I don't know, I don't know the aliens very well because I could never get past the I'm very squeamish about it. Yeah. It's squirgy noises. It's not sound. But, um, uh, it strikes me that the fact that they they are kind of parasites on, on the human characters sort of complicates uh, their relationship a little bit. Um, where an avatar, that it's much less sort of complicated. The question I wanted to ask though was, um, you were saying that sort of traditional sci-fi was white versus green, but that, when I think of traditional sci-fi, I think of Star Trek. And of course, Star Trek, even from the days when it was in black and white, had sort of these multiracial casts. Um, you know, Doctor Spock being sort of very central character, other, other, other right? Uh, who sort of uh, you know uh, uh, becomes a protagonist? I don't know if Octavia Butler had anything to say about Star Trek. Whether she's on record having she didn't like Star Trek. She didn't like yeah. So so why not? <laughs> Do you know why not? Do you know why not? I think no. We I know she's she uh, responded to a question about that. Okay. I happened to be there. Uh, I didn't ask the okay, question. Great. <laughs> but um, uh, like, she didn't like Star Trek. But uh, I think the thing about Star Trek, the, the uh, series, and I want to respond to your comment about aliens, parasites. Okay. parasites. But the thing about uh, Star Trek is that I think the audience, we have, uh, what's his name? Uh, Captain Kirk. Kirk. Uh, and we have a, 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 a series put together in the 60s. I'm sorry. Yeah, the late 60s. Yeah. Are really yeah. A product or uh, an invention of civil rights slash black comedy. This series was responding to this political movement that was happening. And um, in a lot of ways, I think, uh, as I've said a couple of times, that she is a product of that, of that movie. But also, it's being sold to an audience uh, that is down in white America. Because you've got your ratings to keep the shows going. I forget how many seasons it had. It was just record breaking or something. Like but uh, I think it was, it was, it was focused on uh, toward a white audience. Maybe the same adolescent white audience that the literary genre was focused on. And not clearly engaged or critically engaging the, the, the true essence of Spock's difference or otherness or, or Uhuru's, which is, of course, me, is Keith Wahili for independence. Right? A lot of cliches up in there, but you got to sell it to an audience at a particular time period. So I think the uh, commercialization of it was probably one of the elements that Bowler didn't necessarily didn't appeal to her. And the lack of critical engagement of these differences that I think clearly they're clearly there. But of course, why do, I have, why, do, why, do, why do I have to have ears to be different? Or why do I have to be green to be different? Um, can we talk about difference in another way? And I'm not sure that that came. Because I, I love the series myself, all of them. Actually. I think I've seen all of them. Back to the ickiness or the, uh, the parasitic uh, relationship uh, in uh, the Alien series. Octavia Butler, uh, many of her names, including her most recent flesh, the vampire novel, uh, as well as the, uh, the short stories of Bloodshot, Plays with, critiques this notion of parasite versus uh, parasitic relationship versus a uh, symbiotic relationship, right? And so um, the, the scene that actually showed you from the aliens, if you recall, Sir Green Weaver walks into a, a, a nest or a nursery. She sh doesn't, she shouldn't be there. She has a gun in a nursery, right? In a nursery of the natives, the natives nursery. She's not supposed to be there. She's should be identified as bad and wrong, out of place. Instead, the audience is very, oh, yeah, she's going to do it. She's going to do it. They're cheering her when she sets flame to everything with her phallic, her fire throwing phallic symbol. We're cheering her on because we, uh, we, we identify with this Western aesthetic. We identify with 
Okay. Um, but it's not a parasitic relationship in, in the true essence, in the true sense, because they don't attack or seek out the colonizers. The colonizers come, and at no point in that film, no point in that film, are they the aggressors. They only retaliate or react to the aggression of the colonizers, including the scene that I showed you. The queen is like, hey, let's get out, leave, you know? And so she, she looks to her henchmen, her drives to find henchmen, right? And they back off, and she backs up with her, her blonde, blue white, white child, right? Her Western child. And she, who knows what's going to happen next? But she says that when she sees one hatching, being birthed, she says, no, no, genocide must occur because somehow my, my notion or my world might be threatened by that. And so, so granny, we would become the parents. So, if, if any, the, uh, the aliens are never given the opportunity to be uh, anything but parasitical in our mindset in the Western world. The Western, the Western so, just want to Yeah. Oh, you yeah, back here. Yeah, you, you certainly. So this member uh, in a variety of ways, but I'd like to put some focus on two. Number one, I've had the rare privilege of having some time off uh, for many months. That's been exciting, and I've been told not to work. So I've been Amazon.com screening free with your subscription. Uh, the season one of Star Wars. Star Wars, okay. Yeah, you gotta go, yeah, you gotta go back. Yeah. And yeah. If you, you have made a reference about differences. Well, why do you have to have big ears to be different? Can't there be something else? Well, yeah, you can be uh, looking at it a second time. Historically framed differently now that you are from the 1960s into the 21st century. And it's a whole different set of stories that are going on than what you might have thought. Let me take that word, you, and mm -hmm. put it on me. Okay. So all of that is, is it, it has re-fascinated. And what you have said then has given me a kind of set of schemata within which to begin rethinking. And hence, the second part of what you have sold this member of the audience is your book. Where is it? When can I get it? And <laughs> what are we going to do uh, after you leave? Uh, I, don't know. I don't know that there's a response. Yeah, I, I, don't, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if there's a but thank you. And also, too, I thought a great deal about the Star Wars. Yeah. And to come back to you, know, you know, the question about our race. So Anakin Skywalker is a white kid, right? But no, he's not in the context of the narrative. Anakin Skywalker might be the underprivileged from a single household, uh, of a, black, a black male from a single household. Not knowing who his father is, but we do know who his father is. His father is Palpatine. That's another discussion. But of course, he is raised to be this this lack this, in a black in a black you know leather black whatever it is black mechanical hybrid whatever machine versus man. So it, it James Earl Jones's voice. Yeah, with James Earl Jones' voice <laughs> exactly. Uh, this which I always bugged me right, but but, uh, but the, the notion of race in this well. example. It's kind of what I was referring to with Ross's uh, Ripley's character. It, it's complicated. It's not that she's just that she's a white person, a white woman. It's just much more. That almost is made, uh, from certain, from certain level, insignificant to some degree. Right? But at the same time, it is significant. Yeah. Yeah. One, one more thought that sure. comes through. Uh, Emmanuel Kant is said to have was well, said to have said and done many oh, things, but that's over there. But he is said to have missed his regular, as German for regular, regular detention, afternoon walk once, to anyone's knowledge. And that was the day upon which he received Jean, uh, Jean Jacques Rousseau's, a copy of Jean Jacques Rousseau's Amy. Uh, he just sort of got lost in it. So I sort of take that there. I'm now recalling my first read, uh, at, at when it was first published, of uh, Franz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth. 
in which Fanon makes, you know, he's, he's even better than uh, Bergman and Luckman on the social construction of reality. Uh, he is, blah, 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 you know, he's, he's that good. <laughs> in terms of saying what we have is an alternative, and the alternative that we have is to be ruled by those members of our nation states who have been educated in the Sorbonne at, uh, you know, Cambridge, <coughs> Oxford, da, da 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 But they're all white. Or we can engage in a kind of commerce and a kind of governmental structure that is, in fact, community-based. And we can return to the cottage industries. If we choose to be governed by those who appear to have the knowledge, it turns out that we are being ruled by white folks no less than what we have been ruled by under colonization. So when I read that, I'm not putting my side, I just had to get content because at least people who know me know that I've got to get content somehow. But that's it. Uh, the, 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 the shift early on uh, and, and a shift that Butler appears to have been either simultaneously making, or, 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 that is, I don't know when her first novel was or what, you know, what her, what her movie was. 1976. Okay, and so uh, Fanon was in 1963. Uh, so, but things were happening. She was learning stuff, I assume. A product of the movement, yes. And, and, and it was a major, major, uh, move just as Carmichael and Hamilton <coughs> and Black Power. Uh, so I'm seeing these things together and I'm wondering, and here's the question, <coughs> I'm wondering how we bring the genre of science fiction literature into continuing and symbiotic, continuing symbiotic relationship with other genres of human discourse that includes history, philosophy, literature, there's another literature, two more literature, what are, you, what are you old literature people's doing up there? <laughs> Cheating. <laughs> but the answer, you know, the answer seems important in the sense that uh, it's, it's not that we all got to become uh, officiados of science fiction, but we've got to pay attention to it well, in I a different kind of way. Then, then you answered your question. Uh, I think it's already, the relationship, the, the continuity, this kind is already present. Great. Uh, even in popular culture, even in the films we watch, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau has always also said that uh, yeah. uh, the more humanity becomes technologically advanced, the further right. humanity it becomes, yeah. implying that somehow we become less and less connected with our humanness as we become more technical, implying the notion of machines, exactly. right, which is what we have to, the cell phones yes. and so forth, which of course is, is uh, revisioned in the narrative uh, uh, called Matrix, one, two, and three. And, and I was going right? to ask the God. idea that The idea that, uh, which is borrowed from <coughs> Plato's al <coughs> Allegory of the Cave, book right. seven of Plato's Republic, which says that, you know, we're at the bottom of the cave, we're looking at the shadows on the wall, right, and these shadows, it's a social, they're social constructs, right? And every now and then, one person gets out, sees luck, sees life, belly tops, right? Truth and luck, and then comes back, to, just like Neo does, comes back into the, to the, to the, the humanity and tries to tell us that you know. And the point being, the same narratives, it's there. Yeah. We just have to, as you say, uh, look out for it exactly. and see the center because it's nothing new. Exactly. And, and, and so, you, you just remind me of Kill the Pig. Kill the Pig. Uh, Yes. Um, I was interested in the influences on the folklore influences in particular that you mentioned. Um, and I saw a lot of echoes with um, Caribbean folklore and in particular the figure of the, the Haitian zombie, which is an enslaved corpse. Um, and I was wondering if you're aware of or looking at at Caribbean folklore, recording it. Um, uh, <coughs> I can't even know, but Nala Hopkins and absolutely uh, uh, the Brown Girl Circle, bring, uh, Brown, Brown Girl, thank you, and uh, also her, um, her uh, Salt, salt uh, but that was a little recent, but also her uh, uh, Rob, uh, was Nala Hopkins' book entitled uh, 
uh, something robber, I can't think of the title right now. But, uh, but yes, very much. I mean, it's, it's laced with Caribbean uh, folk tales. I mean, that's, that, that defined Nella Hopkinson's body of literature. And she's also, of course, an understudy of Octavia Butler. So, uh, yeah, Octavia Butler, no, but uh, Nella Hopkinson, absolutely. It's, it's laced with Caribbean folk tales. We're talking about, uh, to get back to what you were saying about uh, calling out, I was wondering whether you saw in uh, contemporary science fiction, or maybe even within the alien uh, narratives, uh, a shift, or are we getting more enlightened, uh, or, or are we some people? <laughs> no, no, absolutely, great uh, question, and I would say yes, we are, in the series actually. I didn't talk about movie four, because movie four didn't fit into my scheme of things. But uh, movie four is the, uh, <clears throat> what? She Directed dies in French. three. She, huh? Directed by the French. Yes, yes. She, yeah, so yes, this obviously smarter and not at all it's trying to play over the idea of what's going on, the real narrative, the subtextual narrative. Uh, but movie four, we brought Ripley back to life, because we just saw her die in movie three. But we get her DNA, we clone her, and we, we clone her pregnant so with these aliens. And of course, uh, at the end of this narrative, we have this enlightening uh, narrative in that. It's enlightening in that the, uh, the alien that comes out of her is going to be a queen. It's a queen, but it's white, not black. And it kills its, its, its mother and comes to Ripley and licks her face, suggesting that, uh, uh, what's the movie? The 1939 movie, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, I can't think of the movie. There's two of them, 1939 and 1934 and 59. Thank you very much. It's a replay of Imitation of Life. Uh, because uh, she, this, the alien, the mulatto, which is what I've been arguing the first three movies, the French director, and I can't even his name right now, mm -hmm. comes out and says, Look what this is, look what this is. And I'm like, Yay, yay. And, you know, and so he says, and This is about the tragedy. This is about a, a historical narrative that you can at, a, attach the African American or any marginalized character. You can put, put them in that place of this, this, this alien. And so the alien rejects his dark complexioned uh, alien mother and embraces his humanoid or human white mother. And of course, eventually uh, uh, is killed by uh, the, the clone Sir Green Weaver, Sir Ripley Scott, for other reasons. But, uh, yeah, the, 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 the producers of the films, I think, are saying that the audience must be conscious of these things. And it, it's getting smarter in that respect. And of course, this new film is coming out this summer called Prometheus, the prequel to Aliens 1, I think is going to uh, have some smart uh, things as well. I thought Battlestar Galactica was pretty progressive on this. Like, <coughs> yes, TV2, absolutely. Where, yeah, where yeah. we all turn out to be silent at the end. Yes. So the, the sort of, I mean, it's not. Not specifically about race, but if we, if we go away, but clearly going, machine, it's, robot, the game. analogy yeah. is there yeah. that race is insignificant. What is the notion? What is a human being? Place as we define it's a social construct as well, as well as gender, sexuality, and class. It's a social construct, it's what we define it to be. The stories we tell, the myths we invent, all that stuff. Yeah, so that, yeah, with the end, instead of it being like Darth Vader, where you know, the humanoid robot man is the, the body of the evil, the Bastard Galactica. Everybody ends up being published. Uh, cyborg, Haraway esque feature. Which redefines the notion of humanity. Yeah, which would re re respond to the, the Star Trek. Battlestar Galactica responds <coughs> to Star Trek. It's the smarter version of the 21st century version of what it didn't do. Star Trek did not do. Battlestar Galactica did not do. Uh, I'd like to return to the question about Caribbean sensibility in Bumba. Um, I mean, yeah, well, African sensibility is what I'm referring to. Exactly. That's what I wanted to say because uh, you had already mentioned one of the characters in, in her work, I don't remember which novel, that has the Obanche. Uh, Zoro. Right. Uh, and then you are referring to showing as a uh, 20th, you know, the fourth stage, yes. you know, that deals with Yoruba tragedy yes. and stuff yes. like that. And I'm thinking that kind of dynamic where you have these kinds of you know, migrations of African New World, you know, sensibilities. Um, is it safe to to be so categorical in excising, say, you know, a Caribbean dimension to the kind of aesthetic that informs uh, Butler's work? You know, the kind of way that uh, 
you seem to have disagreed with uh, our observation earlier on. That I can't even not. Yes, you know that it, that it doesn't feature because in the first place, are there really very clearly cut uh, distinctions among these various sides of diaspora sensibility? Okay, no, no, no. I, I would say this. I would uh, say this. I would. I don't really disagree. I was suggesting that now Hopkins. Now Hopkins is does it's it more vivid, okay. detailed job of dealing with Caribbean folklore, whereas. I think uh, Octavia Butler focuses on uh, Europe, particularly uh, in essence, African Europe, African sensibility mm -hmm. throughout throughout all of her narratives, including uh, from beginning to the end, uh, meaning the fleshling from, from uh, wild seed to fleshling. Mm -hmm. So yes, <coughs> this could easily be taught in a, a sort of multicultural <coughs> class, right, right, with focusing on uh, African or non-Western philosophies. Mm -hmm. But I think, of course. Uh, that's coming from the same place that, uh, what is it, uh, uh, what, uh, uh, Amir Baraka's, uh, Amir Baraka's uh, plays and, and poems, as well as uh, uh, Milana Karanga's uh, uh, Black Art Music Battle Given Force and Function, as well as uh, uh, Larry Neal's Black Art Music. This comes from the same place in that she, being a product of that movement, is looking at the most negative and translating it into her own literature. So, uh, yeah, I would definitely say West, West slash East African philosophy or sensibility is definitely playing, played out in Bubba's fiction. I would not say in detail that uh, West, uh, West Indian or Caribbean uh, folklore is being employed. I would say that's being employed in the opposite. Correct. So, Mary Barraza is a mom who is corporate. So writing is a long point entitled Preface to a 20 volume suicide. It's a six line point. And I need, you know, I need to be talking. Crystal uh, McGon, I don't know what his issue is leaving right now. And the begging question I'm asking. Thank you, Gigi, for sticking around. <laughs> but, uh, I read that six-line poem as the single most optimistic narrative that I have seen in Western literature with the most off-putting title. Intriguing though it is, the preface to a 20 volume suicide. Note. And I'm just wondering whether the that, that, that compression uh, might also be brought out into a kind of 20, if not 25, but certainly expanded into how oppression and marginalization as reproduced in this instance one's daughter uh, can become the springboard for optimism and for a future that enhances the aesthetic expanse of human experience. Who's the daughter? Oh, and the point. Okay. It's, it's been a while since I read it. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's the daughter. Um, Butler, Octavia Butler? Yeah does compress all the thoughts. She has a trajectory in the rain, and that trajectory plays out in the par parable series. Gotcha. gotcha. And I, I don't think the fledgling narrative uh, facilitates that trajectory, because it was a book that was written to get her out of the writing slot. I finished book three of the parable series, which was called Parable of the Tricks, which was written, but at least it wasn't published before she died. So, but I do think the parable series does act as that, that, that capsule that shows us where she's coming from and where she was going. Right. In the parable series. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.